session. Um, my co-moderator is going to be uh, Dr. Agarwal is going to join later on. But we're going to talk some exciting uh, topics here, uh, practical event topics for the practicing clinician. So it is a pleasure to invite uh, Dr. David Rubin. Uh, he's a professor of medicine and uh, chief of GI at University of Chicago. He's a very dear friend, always here for our conferences, always like his support. He's going to talk on um, management of hospitalized patients with UC. It's a very common problem we see in practice. So I'd like to hear from David his approach. Welcome, David. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be back, and I just want to compliment the organizers. This course is really top-notch in every way, and it's my pleasure to join my colleagues and educate you about IBD, and thank you for staying to the very end so you could hear this. So I was charged with updating you on managing the patient with severe or fulminant ulcerative colitis. The title was 2023, but I figured I'd give you an update so you can manage beyond this month, so I added 2024. I do have some relevant disclosures that are always uh, relevant when we're talking about managing IBD, but these are completely new slides, and in fact, this talk was made for this, for this conference for you for today. So first, let me just remind you that ulcerative colitis is a condition that has various grades of activity and severity, and the earlier form uh, and index was developed by True Love and Wits, and then modified beyond mild, moderate, and severe to include a condition called fulminant colitis. Fulminant colitis is severe colitis that is progressing literally before your eyes. It's like you're seeing it get worse and worse and you're not able to stop that train that's run off the tracks. And I think that that's a very serious problem, but the patient who's hospitalized actually ends up being of different types that I will classify for you. So there's the patient with severe colitis, just characterized by how active their disease is, and then there's that patient that you need to make sure is uh, having access to a surgeon early. At the American College of Gastroenterology, we updated our guidelines and we modified the True Love and Wits criteria to include those categories, but also a category of remission since we now, of course, focus on that as a goal of management. And we also added urgency, uh, a very important symptom that is present in many, if not most, of our patients with colitis and a surprising number with Crohn's. And surprisingly, you may need to know that the True Love and Wits criteria did not include endoscopic mucosal inflammation as a marker, which of course we all acknowledge now is a very important marker of disease activity. And we added that to our index. Fulminant colitis is progressive, unremitting, and severe, often presents with pain. You should be worried when the patient has pain or fever, which can be a marker of translocation of bacteria. It's an uncommon symptom to have fever when you have ulcerative colitis unless you have a concomitant infection, maybe Crohn's with an abscess, or you have severe disease with translocation of bacteria. And you should recognize that this is still a problem. These are old data that so show you that 9% of people at the time of diagnosis may have fulminant disease, but I think that that still applies to a percentage of our patients. The cause is unknown. I will tell you that I lay awake uh, at night sometimes wondering about that patient of mine that I just admitted, what are we missing? in this very progressive fulminant disease. And we don't always find all the other causes listed here, like an infection. Opioids, of course, can do so. Antibiotics may trigger it. Stopping smoking is a really interesting and very potent environmental trigger of onset of colitis or worsening of existing colitis. Of course, not taking maintenance therapy taking too many antidiarrheal agents to manage the disease, the, the disease symptoms instead of the inflammatory process. And patients who get pregnant who have active colitis may actually have a progression and worsening of their colitis. Here's an example of the endoscopic appearance of a young man who had quit smoking and developed a progressive, severe, and ultimately um, fulminant colitis that required surgery. The picture on the left, by the way, is the forceps looking at the ileocecal valve and the distal ileum just as part of that evaluation. So who needs hospitalization for UC? The patient with severe UC and obvious clinical instability, you know those patients. They're hemorrhaging, they have a dilated uh, colon uh, and risk for megacolon, and of course the patient who's perforated or the patient who needs resuscitation. But then more commonly, the patients we admit for management of their ulcerative colitis are those who have medically resistant therapy. 
uh, to therapy. And what I mean by that is the treatments we're using outpatient are not working, so we bring them into the hospital. And I'm telling you it's a moving target because as we've had some newer therapies become available, the number of people we've admitted to the hospital, I would suggest to you, has gone down. And I want you to think about that as I go through the rest of my presentation. So when we think about what therapies we're using in outpatient before we send somebody to the hospital, it's often, of course, the oral therapies, biological treatments, and more recently, if you've become comfortable with it, you may have been using some of our targeted synthetic small molecules. So I'm just gonna give you four major points and then maybe a fifth in how to take care of these patients. The first thing when you admit a patient with severe colitis, protect your patient. I do suggest that you engage your colorectal surgery team at the time of admission. Even if you think it's unlikely that they're going to need colectomy, you may be wrong, but also the patient needs to know that if their colitis is bad enough to be in the hospital, surgery should meet them and they should take some time to learn about what that might entail. Assess carefully for a toxic megacolon. You can get an x-ray and you should get an x-ray, but honestly, if you've ever seen a toxic megacolon, you can also diagnose it on physical exam. Stop anticholinergics and opioids, and hopefully they're not taking chronic NSAIDs. Stop 5-ASAs. Remember, rarely people are intolerant to 5-ASAs, and it makes them worse, or at least makes their symptoms resistant to other treatments. And start venous thromboembolic prophylaxis. No exceptions. The patient says, oh, I'm getting up, I'm walking around. It's not related to that. It's related to this very active inflammatory process, and you need to put them on a VTE prophylaxis, usually with sub cutaneous, uh, low vinox or low molecular weight heparin, and then rule out infection. Even if they haven't had an obvious exposure, you should be looking for C. diff and CMV. Reminder that patients with active colitis and certainly severe colitis have a very high and very well-described risk of venous thromboembolic complications, and during an actual hospitalization, it's eight-fold higher than somebody who is outpatient that you're managing and you should not miss this. In addition, there's some work from Canada that suggests even after a patient goes home from the hospital, there may still be a risk, although we haven't done the work yet to say you should continue anticoagulation after they leave the hospital like the orthopods do for knee replacements. Nonetheless, you should also acknowledge what's on the right in this slide, which is that the older the patient gets, the more likely they are ahead of this complication as well. So don't miss this. My surgeon and I believe that when someone has a venous thromboembolic complication related to their IBD, it's an independent predictor of surgery, that they're going to need surgery. Now, that hasn't been proven yet, but I think many in the room who are experienced would agree. Number two, resuscitate and treat concomitant infections. Obviously, you're going to resuscitate and transfuse if necessary. I wanted to update you that for C. diff, the updated IDSA guidelines, which do include some discussion of IBD, now include Vanco and fidaxomycin as your options for first-line management of the C. diff. For recurrent C. diff, the um, newer treatment enema therapies or the biological uh, treatment against the toxin are available, but not as first-line management in C. diff. And if they have CMV biopsy confirmed, not just a titer that you might pick up in a serum assessment, then you would treat with gencyclovir. The uh, current state of our management is you do not withhold treatment of the active colitis while you're treating the infection. So you start your steroids, you give your infliximab or whatever other therapy you might use, and you should continue that through their hospitalization and onward. So it used to be that we said, oh, stop all the immunotherapies while we're trying to treat the infection. We've now learned from a variety of lines of evidence that treating the colitis actually enables clearance of the infection more effectively and certainly hasn't made things worse. So you should remember this as one of your new take-homes and an evolution in our management. We know patients who have C. diff, even if you've treated it effectively, or have a higher risk for subsequent colectomy. You can see that this has been shown in many studies in many different ways over the years. So you should remember that if that patient had C. diff as an outpatient or you've diagnosed it as an inpatient, that even if they seem to be getting better, you've already given them a marker that they're likely to end up with a colectomy down the, down the road, and you should be having that conversation with them and thinking carefully about it. In addition, you might consider treating them longer, although this is a retrospective case control from our center. I will tell you that we showed that if you treated for 28 days instead of 10 days, 
it seemed to make sense and it had a lower risk of recurrence, although not a statistically lower risk of reinfection. The difference is whether it occurs test positive within eight weeks of the first treatment. Uh, so I do think treating longer with whichever your first line agent is for C. diff in the case of IBD makes some sense. We've also shown that a patient who's had C. diff has a higher rate of pouch complications after their colectomy. Now that's something to keep in mind in the back of your head as we learn more about how to prevent pouchitis. But this study from our center of over 400 patients showed the patient who had C. diff previously was twice as likely to have pouch failure downstream. That means the pouch had to be removed or they developed serious complications of their pouch. Number three, treat the inpatient with UC. And here are your treatment options. They're, they haven't evolved quite as much as we'd like, but the data exists, of course, for IV steroids, for infliximab, for cyclosporin, which I recognize most of you, if not all of you, don't use. And then more recently, we're interested in whether our small molecule JAK inhibitors might be available for these types of patients. And I'll update you on that. So this is not new. The data on steroids are old, but they are pretty consistent. If a patient doesn't respond within three days in significant uh, improvement, you should recognize that this is unlikely to respond in the next seven days. So don't continue IV steroids hoping that each day it's gonna get a little bit better. It often does not, and there are some very nice indices to suggest. In general, we look for a CRP that's dropping and stool frequency to go down quickly. And if we don't rely only on symptoms, we now are using intestinal ultrasound. And I recognize many of you, if not most of you, are not having this available in your practice, but I wanted to tell you about it for a second. On the left up top is what an inflamed colon can look like. Bowel wall thickness is a key marker, as well as loss of the house stray, loss of the ability to see the normal architecture of the colon. On the right is what a normal colon can look at after treatment. And the bottom is the color Doppler part of doing intestinal ultrasound. Why am I showing you this? Because actually a nice study showed that with IV steroids, intestinal ultrasound picked up a change in bowel wall thickness within 24 hours. So we can start to compress our timeline to say, this patient's responding to this treatment or not, and it may actually change the way we think about managing inpatient UC. And I recognize you don't all do that, but I will tell you that the field is moving to think about the benefit of transmural assessment of the colitis to know whether it predicts colectomy or not. This nice study from our colleagues in Milan, Italy, using what they call the Milan ultrasound criteria, suggested that full thickness improvement of the, of the colon uh, reduce the risk of colectomy significantly more than just what you see by endoscopy. So stay tuned, that's where the field of severe colitis is trying to move. The old studies of infliximab were either a single infusion or maybe a couple infusions, and we learned that it often worked in patients with severe colitis. The caveat, though, is I want to remind you that in the early days of infliximab, people got admitted just to get their infliximab. So what you're seeing here in these very nice results we're actually not the sick patients that we often admit now in the US and in the rest of the world. So it's nice to know that this, work, this drug works in patients who are hospitalized with UC, but I wanna point out to you, these are not the sickest patients like often you are admitting and seeing in your practice. People often think, well, I'll just give more and more infliximab and we'll override that severe colitis. The data don't actually support that as much as you'd like. Sure, we're all comfortable giving 10 milligrams per kilogram, and I do it when I start infliximab in the hospital setting, and then maybe give a second dose a week later, but the data don't suggest that downstream you're actually preventing colectomy. Marla's gonna teach us about precision medicine, and we're gonna talk about that and how we might avoid losing response to the drug, and we'll leave that to her in a minute. So what about small molecules? Well, the concept of small molecules in IBD, I think is a treatment revolution. It, in IBD. So one of the other major takeaways from this presentation is to recognize that when a patient has severe colitis, they're leaking protein. That's a common phenomenon. And if you're giving a protein-based therapy like infliximab or frankly any of our other monoclonal antibodies, you may not get enough of the drug in to do its job. The mechanism may be okay, 
but the pharmacodynamics are altered. So it's like trying to fill a bathtub when the drain is open. You can't get enough in. And in fact, we've measured infliximab in stool, which is what this graph shows, and the more you pick up in the stool, the less likely they are to respond, which makes sense. The drug is going in by the IV and out through the toilet and not doing what we'd like it to do in terms of managing the disease. So that's where we think about all of our small molecules. The old small molecule that we still use and Sinai still uses and other places have uh, used is cyclosporin. And it has a role and there are data for it for many, many studies over the years. It's usually after failure of IV steroids, it's added on, it is a small molecule. It has a whole bunch of contraindications that make people nervous about it, but it does work uh, and it has a very high success rate. I'm not here to sell you on cyclosporin. We can talk about another small molecule though, which is our JAK inhibitors. Very rapid absorption in the proximal small bowel, very predictable pharmacokinetics. However, I wanna show you that this work, which is predominantly led by our colleagues at the University of Michigan, is in uh, off-label dosing. You'll notice that the dose of tofacitinib that worked was 10 TID, and the dose of upatacitinib they studied was what they called high intensity, which was 30 BID. I am not here to tell you that you should start doing this in your practice. I think we need some more studies to understand this. What I would suggest is what's at the bottom of this slide. If you're not using the JAK inhibitor in your patient who's outpatient and has been on an anti-TNF, maybe you can prevent the hospitalization altogether rather than admitting them and trying to figure it out in the hospital. So for the patient who's not fulminant, who might be just somebody who's not responding to your medical therapies, make sure you're becoming more comfortable and familiar with our new therapies, and Gary's gonna teach you more about that in his lecture. And then number four, have a maintenance plan. So it's fine if you get them out of the hospital, but what are you gonna do to actually change their outcome? Close follow-up, don't send them out and say, call me and let me know how you're doing in a few months. Steroid sparing therapies must be on board and used. Uh, if you're using infliximab, Marla will teach you about proactive therapeutic monitoring, either a pre-third loading dose level of more than 15, 17, 17 or maybe even earlier, knowing what that level might be over 20 after two doses. But the point here is that you can think about knowing that because it'll tell you if they're gonna lose response and maintenance. If you're using cyclosporin, either overlap it with a bridge strategy or consider another drug and make sure you're monitoring their disease so you know that they're getting where you think they are. There's a bunch of work that's been done looking at cyclosporin bridge to vetolizumab, both retrospective and prospective. Veto is so safe that we've done that as a way to use that as a maintenance therapy. The original work is the first row there. My colleague Russell Cohen in the 1990s with Steve Hanauer showed that azathioprine was the drug to use. Many of us are not using aza anymore, but uh, the point is after cyclosporin, you need a maintenance therapy. And here's some suggestions. We've also expanded this now beyond to use tekinumab, ozanamod, and what I call tandem, which is where you stop the cyclosporin, it washes out, and then you start TOFA, and maybe there's other ways we can think about creative solutions. So you might wanna know, did, have we reduced hospitalizations for UC? We've got all these new drugs every week, probably since I've been standing at the podium, there's another FDA approval. And the reality is that at least with the data out to 2018, we didn't really see it, although we have reduced mortality, think, thankfully. So I do think that there's still a need to understand how to do this, and I'm grateful to you, Day, and the, and the organizers for inviting me to speak about it. Number five, don't forget about surgery. I told you to call the surgeons when they get admitted. Remember that this is effective, and no patient says, I'm ready for surgery until they feel like they've tried everything. Well, you have to decide what does that mean? And you should draw a line in the sand and have a, a reasonable communication with them about why surgery is appropriate in many patients and how it will work and give them a timeline. Because the patient always thinks we're holding out. What's that one last drug that you haven't tried yet? I want that one. And you need to be comfortable and understand if you wait until it's urgent, Mina Butra and others have shown that they are much more likely to have serious complications or even death. So that's not the time to have surgery. We need to have some comfort. We've done this, your colon is progressing despite all of our efforts and we need to move on. We have reduced the need for surgery in UC, so we may not have reduced hospitalizations, but we have reduced surgery rates. If you look at the trends here, and that's good news, but that doesn't mean surgery isn't still needed. 
At U of C, one of my colleagues, Dayan Michik, led some work that showed that if you're young, if you've had one or more biological exposures, and if you've already been hospitalized needing infliximab or cyclosporin, you have significantly increased risk of having surgery by the end of a year. So don't think that getting them out of the hospital means you're home free. You might still have a very substantial risk of needing surgery within that year, and you have to be vigilant and have that conversation. So in summary, I've given you five points. Protect your patient, Resuscitate and treat infections. Don't stop your immunotherapies. Choose therapies wisely and understand why small molecules may be beneficial given that very inflamed state. Make sure you have a steroid sparing maintenance plan and you're following up closely. And don't forget about surgery. If you want to read more, there's a very nice article we published a couple years ago that's not out of date. And there's a QR code and you can have the whole pub for your uh, own reference and review. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, David. Excellent presentation. Uh, the next topic is going to be on um, positioning small molecules and uh, neural biologics in the IBD treatment algorithm. As David mentioned, we have lots of new advances. Uh, we had two new medicines approved in the last couple of months. So I've talked to Gar uh, Gary to talk about all this. So Gary Lichtenstein is a professor of medicine and director of IBD at uh, UPenn. And he's going to probably update us on all the new advances in the treatment. Welcome. Gary. Thank you. How do I get the slides up? I'll just click through my, sorry. Thank you, Day. Uh, Terrific program as always and fabulous. Uh, it was enjoyable to listen to other aspects of gastroenterology in addition to the IBD. I usually go to meetings and it's solely the IBD that I listen to. But today I'm gonna to talk about a topic that is near and dear to many people. It's how do you position the novel therapies that have come out, small molecules and biologics. These are my disclosures. Um, when we talk about this, I'm going to talk about three particular areas. Bio-naive patients, bio-experienced patients, and patients with extraintestinal manifestations. So if we look at the, quote, alphabet soup, as some people would say, of the medical therapies we have for IBD, and some of which are up and coming, we can see we have different groups. The anti-TNFs, the anti-IL-1223s, David alluded to the JAK inhibitors, sphingus and phosphate uh, modulators as well, and the NA integrins. And you're saying, well, how do I choose? Which ones are appropriate? When should I consider these? And in what scenarios are they best to treat the patients? So it's a puzzle. And this represents a nice schematic of what we think of in our minds. The efficacy of the drug, the rapidity of onset is important as well when we think of a medical therapy. Are they hospitalized? Are they puttering along slowly and not having a good outcome? And do you need to do something within the next month or so? And we'll talk about time to onset of efficacy based upon recent data directly. What's the patient? Are they young? Are they older? Are they going to be pregnant soon? These are things we contemplate in medical therapies. What's the disease extent? Do they have extra intestinal manifestations as well? And can we accomplish something by treating them directly? So when we look at this, we look at the disease severity. The mild disease, again, mesalamine represents an excellent choice and by no means should not be considered in that population. But we'll talk more about those that are the moderate to severe disease, if you would. And when looking at things, we say, let's do comparative effectiveness. But the problem is there's not great data for everything that we'd like to compare. We have three different ways to look at this, in a network or a meta-analysis, if you would, and we could do real-world evidence uh, looking at population cohort assessments or head-to-head -head trials. Ideally, head-to-head -head trials would be the way to go to do comparative effectiveness looking at superiority 
Uh, however, they're costly and they're not being done for every agent that we use, but we do have one for ulcerative colitis. So I'll review that single trial, if you would. There's several ongoing. Which therapy first, which therapy second? And we rely on network meta-analyses because we only have that one particular trial that's been done to date in ulcerative colitis, the varsity trial. Um, and this is looking at vetalizumab versus adalimumab at 52 weeks in ulcerative colitis. Double-blind, randomized, phase 3b study, 790 patients with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis and designed as a superiority trial. Adalimumab was less effective reaching the primary endpoint than vetalizumab, the uh, clinical remission. Endoscopic improvement was seen as well to be superior in vetalizumab, uh, and corticosteroid-free remission was better in adalimumab. But there are many caveats to this trial. When we look at this directly, we have secondary endpoints, uh, but there's no dose escalation, no drug levels. If on steroids and immune modulators, there is no difference between the groups, and there's no benefit in prior TNF exposure groups. So with those caveats, does that represent clinical practice? This is something you have to contemplate when you look at the study and putting it into general assessment. Is it useful for you? So when we don't have head-to-head -head trials, we do use network meta-analyses. And this is your goal today to memorize this to get CME credit. <laughs> I'm going to ask you every point on this slide. But the take-home point from this is, um, and the violet is the statistically significant ones that are important recently. This is looked at by sequencing of moderate to severely active ulcerative colitis, and this is a sucra ranking. So the higher the number, the better the outcome. And as you can see, ozanamide is good, infliximab is good, uh, and we have other things as well that we can glean from this. 29 trials, over 10,000 patients, endpoints 6 to 14 weeks. Infliximab, ozanamide, and upadacitinib were the best overall. But you may say, that's great, what about safety? So in the same network meta-analysis, safety was looked at, and the take-home point was no drug is more likely than placebo to lead to severe adverse events. The relative risk of these adverse events was significantly less with vetalizumab, golimumab, and ustekinumab than placebo. So think of safety when you contemplate using a drug. Vetalizumab was the best performing for safety, and upadacitinib 45 milligrams was the most likely to lead to adverse events. Vita was the least likely. UPA 45 ranked the last for infections, significant to compare to placebo. So when you use a medication, think of the patient and contemplate what's best. Now what about bioexperience patients? Well, again, we have a large number of medical therapies that are available for ulcerative colitis that are biologics or small molecules. Here they are listed with the appropriate studies, and how do you go ahead and choose this? So let's look at efficacy after biologic exposure. Vetalizumab had reduced efficacy after biologic exposure, and if you look at this not only in the overall efficacy numbers, but you look at the number needed to treat, or the delta, if you would. The delta is less in this group as well. Some, the delta is the same, so the NNT is the same as before, but the numbers are just lower, so that may be study design issues. Ustekinumab, no reduced efficacy in anti-TNF exposed based on the data presented by Bruce Sands, the unified data. Ozanamod did have reduced efficacy. If you look, biologic naive, 23 versus 6.6, .6, one biologic. 17 versus eight, or a delta of nine. And then you get two or more biologics, it's 2%, two and a half percent for placebo versus 3.7% of the delta of 1.2. So really not as effective once you're down to your second biologic. Tofacitinib, small molecules, again you'll see, are not gonna be reduced based upon their exposure. And the IL-23s, are not going to be lowered as well. These are the key points that we'll learn from these. Upadacitinib, not reduced in bioexposed patients with ulcerative colitis. So these are things to contemplate once you have a patient who's bioexposed. And remember, 
the label for upadacitinib and tofacitinib is after you're exposed to anti-TNF, this is the time to contemplate its use. A meta-analysis by Sid Singh was done. This is before the era of some of these agents gained regulatory approval, and ustekinumab, tofacitinib were at the leaders as it came to such. But recently there was ECHO. I'm going to put a lot of the recent data was just presented several months ago at ECHO and put that into place. So mirakizumab, effective as induction and maintenance therapy, moderate to severe ulcerative colitis, regardless of the number and the types of prior advanced therapy failure. So again, the IL-23s don't have the decrement in efficacy after initial therapy with a biologic or the small molecules. Those are key take-home points. The Elevate program was etrasimod, recently published data, recently gained regulatory approval. This is a 12-week induction uh, and a 40-week maintenance therapy versus the, that's the Elevate 52, and the Elevate 12 was a 12-week induction, and then they had an open label. If you look overall, and this is a lot of data just to put before you, but the bottom line is, among patients with clinical response at week 12, more patients treated with active therapy versus placebo achieved week 52 efficacy. Etrasimod, though, had uh, decreased efficacy in the biologic JAK-exposed patients, and this is highlighted here in the tables in the supplement. So if you go into the supplement tables, you can see all the differences, and it's substantial decrease. So if you need that benefit that's superior, you really want to contemplate using something that is not going to have a lower benefit overall in patients with subsequent exposure uh, directly. So here's a general assessment of the efficacy. If you look at the numbers, when you look at the trials, I put this together to give an idea. This is clinical remission. So etrasimod is about 25%. The other biologics, the anti-TNFs, are about 18, 19, 17 percent. The highest you'll see is for the JAKs, the overall efficacy. And this is clinical remission, so you're talking 26, 33 percent, 20 percent. These are all good numbers. And the problem is we can't predict if a patient is going to respond to an agent. We have to try it and see. So we position patients. There's pros and cons of each particularly do they work in certain scenarios, whether they be etrasimod, ozanimod, upadacitinib, mirakizumab. The question with the IL-23s is, are extraintestinal manifestations benefited substantially? And that's part of the difficulty. They're not as good as the anti-TNFs or the JAK inhibitors. So then we look at other things, rapidity of onset of action. A recent network meta-analysis was published literally months ago that looked at this directly. Um, and you can see each agent, when looking at the registration trials, how fast is this with regards to onset of action, whether it's induction of response or remission, as is highlighted here. But I think the key things that we take home is upadacitinib was superior to all agents and tofacitinib were similar uh, for induction of clinical response and clinical remission. And this was looking two weeks after, and we'll go through the data. It's actually one day for upadacitinib and three days for the onset of response with uh, tofacitinib. Ustekinumab and ozanimod ranked the lowest when you look at the efficacy, the rapidity of onset. Data from upadacitinib within one day. Gil Morial published his paper in Journal of Crohn's Colitis. Tofacitinib, data Steve Hanauer presented, three days after the onset of treatment, you can see there's clearly benefit that's statistically significant. Etrasimod, looking at this directly, you can see as early, very early on, and this is highlighted here where I'm pointing, you can see the difference. Gaselkamab, data I just presented at ACG, uh, was only looked at at one and two weeks. So earlier in the diary cards, it may be more rapidly affected, but this is through week 12. And stool frequency goes down rapidly as well. So early on is what we'd like for our patients to avoid using high-dose steroids if we can, and can we completely avoid steroids in treating patients directly? So looking at how long should we wait, this is based on different numbers 
uh, that are presented in different trials, um, 12 weeks, 10 weeks, 16 weeks, these are the data from the trials based upon the data from the trials, but sub-analyses, as I showed you, are better to predict what might occur in clinical practice. And looking at Crohn's as well, although I'm not talking much about Crohn's because ulcerative colitis has most of the data, you can look at the different agents, and this is based on an IOIBD position statement directly looking at the different agents. Response, remission, normalization of CRP, decreased calprotectin, and endoscopic healing. Each has a different time point, and it's impossible for you to memorize these, but to look these up, one can do this directly. So when we look at a therapy, we have to say, does, uh, what occurs, what several things occur? Act safely. So we have vetalizumab, ustekinumab, ozanamod, etrasimod, mirakizumab, fall into this bucket, if you would. And then if they act quickly, we're looking at tofa, upadacitinib, uh, and the TNF antagonists work relatively rapidly as well. And then, those that have mild disease, remember, mesalamine, budesonide are appropriate to contemplate in this population. So think of the scenario, put it in context, and use it appropriately. The EIMs are important because we recognize many patients have extraintestinal manifestations, and which drugs treat them? Well, we know the anti-TNFs, the JAK inhibitors are excellent at that as well, and these represent the best overall treatments we have. Um, when we look at different agents, you might say, I don't have all the answers, I don't know what to do with everything, so we'd like to best sequence biologics. Should we use drug one, then two, then three in the sequence? And the answer is we don't know. We'd like to have biomarkers that we can predict this with. Unfortunately, sorry to burst your bubble, insurance does predict a lot of this, and this is what we go through. It's the doc to docs, which we all love doing, uh, and wish that there would be some national guidance based upon evidence to, hey, say this is the way to go. The full picture you need to take into account, the age, the comorbidities, the extraintestinal manifestations. So just to take you through some of the scenarios that I think of when doing this. Someone has psoriasis, the things to contemplate, ustekinumab, anti-TNFs, upadacitinib, and mirakizumab. These are on-label approved for this population. Over the age of 60, comorbid cancer, uh, recent infection, veto, ustekinumab, mirakizumab. Typically, these are the agents one would contemplate. Synovitis or arthritis, the JAKs and the anti-TNFs are the best in this scenario. And, and in a similar fashion, axial arthropathy, one thinks of anti-TNFs and upadacitinib in this patient population. Low albumin, think of small molecules. TOFA and upadacitinib represent the best, and they're not influenced based upon one would think. Upadacitinib is now being evaluated in this scenario. Tofacitinib, we published the data for that, showing no difference in outcomes based on serum albumin. Whereas with anti-TNF therapies and fliximab, that's the best predictor of response when you look at all the factors directly. The need for speed, if you would, in fliximab, upadacitinib, tofacitinib, the most rapid. Preconception pregnancy anti-TNFs, vetalizumab, any monoclonal antibody is fine to use in that scenario, and you're okay. Stop methotrexate or azathioprine greater than three months. UPA, stop at least a month before, uh, probably three months. There's not good data on that. It's being evaluated. And combination therapy, you don't need with biologics, only the anti-TNFs, as best we recall, or as best we know to date. Efficacy then, just going through this, it's decreased with the prior biologic exposure in all biologic agents uh, and molecules, but it's not decreased with the number needed to treat uh, when you have the anti-IL-23s and the JAK inhibitors. Whereas with Vito, Ozanamod, Adalimumab, and Etrasimod, it is decreased in both scenarios. So to conclude, what do you consider when choosing a medication for patients with IBD? The severity of the colitis data beautifully outlined uh, what one would do based upon the disease severity. 
Is it steroid dependent, refractory, hospitalized? Do you have options for JAK inhibitors, cyclosporin, and fleximab? And then the patient factors. Is a patient have a cancer? Are they at a high cancer risk? Do they have infection recently? Are they childbearing, elderly? Do they have extraintestinal manifestations? Are they naive patients versus exposed to biologics? And then what does a patient prefer? Shared decision making is critical in what we do is it IV sub-Q or oral and also cost and insurance coverage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. I know it's a tough topic to summarize in 15 minutes. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Boshan next. He's going to talk on um, interventional IBD, a new frontier in the management of IBD. He's a professor of uh, medicine at uh, Columbia University in New York. So it's a pleasure to have you, Bo. Thank you. So the, actually, I really enjoyed uh, the talk at the, I was almost given by Albert Einstein. It's a, it's a very scientific. My talk is very like plumber. What the plumber is doing, fix the leak and the clogging. Actually, this is a, uh, so the, the evolution of the interventional IBD from the balloon dilatation of the structure to EMR, ESD for some of the patient with the uh, colitis associated neoplasia, then structurotomy, fistulotomy, and structuroplasty endoscopically to the various kind of the IBD surgery associated complications. So this is the, uh, each year that table, that number of the table the content increased. So five major category for implication of the endoscopic therapy in IBD, structure, fistula, and the abscess, and the bezoar fallen body, and the blocking luminal lesions, such as the inflammatory polyps, and IBD surgery associated complications, and then colitis associated neoplasia. So the talk about the structure, very quick. So uh, the, our um, group, with the called a Global Interve uh, Interventional uh, IBD Group, and that actually the, uh, Dr. Rubin and the Dr. Uh, Namanithan are the part of the, the consensus uh, guideline group uh, proposed this, uh, the classification of IBD structure. So IBD structure, I think the most important one is the length of the structure and then the complexity of the structure. If the length of the structure is shorter than Five, four to five centimeters, the, most of the, those structure is eligible, eligible for the endoscopic therapy. And then also need to define the anasmotic structure with the primary structure. Typically, anasmotic structure responds to the endoscopic therapy better. Before we do the endoscopic therapy, some form of the abdominal imaging is needed to make sure there's no nearby uh, the, you know, fistula, abscesses, et cetera. So this is the, um, the slide we said, how to differentiate inflammatory structure versus a fibrotic structure. I think that from the perspective from, at the endoscopist, you can use the biopsy forcep or tip of the of balloon, knock around. If they're very friable, I would suspect that this is an inflammatory structure. If they're very stiff, we call it the fibrotic structure. You can use other fancy tools as intestinal um, ultrasound, CT scan, and MRI. As an endoscopist, as a plumber, I still believe this uh, plumber's, old plumber's tool of the work the best in terms of the accuracy to detect the structure. All the patients with the structure IBD structure in the small bowel, large bowel, at the time of the first therapy, we call it index therapeutic endoscopy, you have to take biopsies. An asthmatic structure or a primary disease associated structure, that this patient, we found the structure at the ileocolonic anastomosis, very tough and then biopsy showed invasive uh, adenocarcinoma. Now we have a tool for balloon dilatation. Typically, the goal of the balloon dilatation, you may uh, take the several sessions to reach the 18 to 20 millimeters size. Now we have, uh, over the years, actually Dr. Nathan, we worked together at Cle uh, Cleveland and we developed this uh, the structure of plasty, use a needle knife or IT knife, and even we do the uh, endoscopic called endoscopic structure plasty. Basically, you open the structure with a knife and a clip it. Clip here is for serve the, for three purposes: prevent bleeding, prevent perforation, and the most important one, put the spacer in between. So prevent the leak closure of the uh, structure. Now, not all the patients with um, 
uh, qualify for structural plasty. The typical structural plasty, we call endoscopic structural plasty, apply for this patient with a short structure, ileocolonic uh, anastomosis structure, especially side-to-side -side anastomosis structure. Now, we called staple, dislodged staple is a corporate for staple bleeding as well as the structure. So if you, uh, the staple is more than six months old, you find a dislodged staple and endoscopically you can remove it and this is show the picture of the, the after removal of the structure and then later on uh, the, the, the structure, is, uh, the anastomosis is wide open. Talk about a stent, it's a very fancy topic actually. In rare occasion, we use a stent to treat a benign disease of the low GI tract. Now, this is the, the called, uh, um, nail and the coffin. The nice study by our friends at, at uh, University of Barcelona. Compare the self-expandable covered stent versus the balloon dilatation. Actually, the study showed the balloon dilatation had a numerical advantage of over stent in terms of efficacy and safety. So that's the, uh, we say you should not put the stent for the patient with the uh, Crohn's disease. And uh, now this is the new kit on the block. So there's a drug coated balloon. Currently we run the clinical trial and the drug is coated with the anti-fibrosin agent. Same agent used for angioplasty and the uh, BPH uh, with the uh, urinary uh, blockage symptoms. So the, this is to tell you, this the patient has the uh, example. The patient has a pouch inlet structure, refractory. They come to the oil for routine endoscopic therapy with a balloon, a mechanical balloon, or structurotomy every one to three months. Then with the drug-coated balloon, and this is the next day, you can see the, 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 the opening, and then typically the, by estimate, <coughs> that drug-coated balloon may increase the interval for next endoscopy as compared to mechanical balloon about twice or three times. Now, I'm a big a fan of the intraoperative uh, um, structure therapy with, through the endoscopy. Your surgeon will serve as, a, as a, your assistant, especially good for this patient with a multiple structure in the small bowel. That basically, they can pull the part of the small bowel out. You, you can introduce the scope and you do the aggressive and, uh, endoscopic therapy with the balloon dilatation or structurotomy. Now, next one, the fistula and abscesses. I'll give you a example. So the, your, this will be your dream patient. Patient had a severe, long-term ileocecal valve structure. Over the time, they can develop the ileocecal fistula. If the fistula is shorter than three centimeters, the thickness shorter than two centimeters, you can do the combined fistulotomy and structurotomy. Basically, you, you can cure those patients. This is the example. You can use the jag wire to detect the fistula. You do the, uh, use a needle knife or IT knife and the, do the fistulotomy and put the clip in the both sides. Now, next one is a bezoar and fallen body, etc. So if they have the trapped um, a capsule, it's quite often associated with structure. You've treated the structure and then use a rotnet to take the capsule out. And then the, some of the people have the bezoar on top of the proximal to the uh, structured, the structured bowel, you treat the structured bowel and then use a tool to take the bezel out. And dislodge the staples can cause bleeding as well as the structure, just remove it. And then those inflammatory polyp, although the uh, risk of the dysplasia is very low, but however, this is the pain can cause the symptoms of the blockage as well as the chronic anemia. Remove it. But, uh, Everybody had a concern about the removed inflammatory polyp because they are very vascular. Now there's a new a tool to prevent and control the bleeding, such as the spray of the 50% glucose, and then also there's an agent called a Puristat, is our best friend nowadays. So IBD surgery associated complications, and uh, so for example, anastomotic bleeding. So there are two things you should avoid, no epinephrine, no cauterization, no APC, because IBD doesn't like heat. IBD doesn't like the, the, um, the epinephrine because there's a component of the ischemia to begin with. So what do you do? Mechanical and chemical. Basically, you can spray the agent and you can do the 
eclipse. Actually, this patient was, uh, had uh, anastomotic bleeding, we treated this way, and then patient not happy, and still had a little bit of bleeding, went to the surgery, and this after surgery, still recurrent anastomosis at the iliocolonic. So we treated the clips so far two years without further bleeding after the, we put the uh, 15 clips. So far, the, uh, the Columbia University gave me the free hands. Uh, I use a lot of the clips, a very expensive clips, right? So that now this is the new kit block. I think it's a, our best friend as an interventional IBD person. It's called Puristat. So when you do the stricture therapy or the balloon dilatation, you can spray that agent. It's pretty effective. Now this is a uh, talk about uh, the surgical leak. So the uh, surgical leak is very common in people with the Crohn's disease. And then for the people with the iliocolonic anastomosis with the resection, it's an anastomotic leak and a transverse staple line leak and a surgical uh, structural plastic side leak and a, also the stoma side leak. So people with a pouch for the uh, treatment of the uh, colitis. So the pouch common leak actually is number two, we call the tip of the J or number one here called a presacral sinus. So if the leak is pretty big, and then if you cannot control with a small clip, you can use uh, over the scope clip. Typically you do not do the 40, uh, 11 size or 14 size. 14 size is too big. The best size is 12 size. Now if you tiny clip, tiny uh, fistula, surgery related, the vaginal fistula or uh, uh, pouch vaginal fistula or the rectal vaginal fistula, then you can put a clip there. Now, if the tiny clip at the tip of the J, you can use a strong clip, such as a Cook clip and the old Mantis clip from Boston Scientific. By the way, I don't have any conflict in interest of the drug company and the old device company, so just give the name. Now, this is called a pre sinus as a nightmare of the colorectal surgery. I call the sinus, it's like we call a mafia, and then pouch body, we call it it's a society. You cannot beat the mafia. Let, what do we do? We invite the mafia to become a part of society so by cutting this rule. <laughs> now this is what we call the epithelialized sinus. Now it's a great Las Vegas. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so here's the example of the post, uh, posterior uh, war, pre sinus. You give the, to the sinusotomy, put a clip there, and it epithelialized that cavity that become part of the pouch. Now there's a new kit at the block, actually, with a extensive surgery, especially lapros laparoscopy surgery, and then fancy robotic surgery. You know what? Surgeon want to decrease the, this uh, post-operative scar tissue. They created a problem, twisted the bowel. Actually, at our Center for in uh, Interventional IBD and the um, pouch center at Columbia, I would say that one third of the patients in my uh, two days, two, four days of uh, endoscopic treatment, one third of them has some form of a twisted bowel or banded bowel. So you can use fund application, similar things, um, work very well. So colitis associated neoplasia, very exciting. I don't believe the data that showed the the re resolution of the high definition as good as a chromoendoscopy. I'm routinely used chromoendoscopy. This the patient has rectal dysplasia, posterior war, underwent multiple sessions with the ESD, and of course she refused, uh, he refused the surgery at age 80, 86. We follow that in nodule. So this is a standard high definition lesion. Then you can do the narrow band, you can see a little bit more, the area is wider, same patient. If you use the magnified, you see a little bit more, right? Magnified a little bit more. But if you do the chromoendoscopy, combine the narrow band, actually the area is larger. So I believe this is a, a, the chromoendoscopy is still a main player in terms of the uh, surveillance uh, uh, endoscopy in pouch and in, I, uh, in IPD2. Now, regardless of all the expert uh, the saying, they can do the, remove the dysplastic lesion end block. So far, I have zero success in the end block. I still do the piecemeal. Look at the large area we removed, right? Piecemeal, because sub, extensive submucosal fibrosis. Very hard, and uh, I, 
in my uh, practice, I only do the EST if the patient had a rectal lesion, posterior, posterior wall. If the anterior wall or the flat lesion in the other part of the colon, I recommend the patient had a colectomy with a, with a pouch. So this is our last slide, the interventional IBD, where it goes. So it's a, we need to find out the nature of the structure, nature of the structure, how to differentiate inflammatory structure, fibrotic structure, and then we need to define the rule of the anorectal structure as association with the perianal fistula. AI is important for the surveillance as well as the disease monitoring. We need a new stent. We need to um, investigate more um, um, the good tool for the uh, deep uh, scope, especially distal small bowel. And we need a drug eroding uh, agent. There's a um, balloon as well as a stent. Cell therapy, you know, the cell therapy for the stem cell therapy, nowadays is for fistula, is a, you need an EUA by correct surgeon. We may develop something through the, through the, through the, through the endoscopy. And then we need to optimize the safety and outcome of the EMR and the EST. Uh, we need to still have some issue with the post-procedure bleeding perforation. We need to, um, actually these things that we learn a uh, lot from Raju, from the, um, MD Anderson. S training, certification, and uh, uh, billing is uh, still a challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bo. Uh, going to the last topic of the Congress, uh, we're going to ask Dr. Mala Dubinsky to talk on new approaches to IBD, the use of precision medicine. Uh, so Mala Dubinsky um, is a professor of medicine and also chief of pediatric GI at Mount Sinai. Pleasure to have you, Marla, again. Thank you. Thank you again for the invite. You want to just find my slide. I want to spoil the ending. Let's go to the beginning. Okay, fantastic. Um, again, thank you. And as Dave noted, the organization, um, particularly Jason and Ashley, have been fantastic. So we feel like this is our second home. So thanks for inviting us back. As Uday noted, I'm going to try and teach you all about precision medicine and inflammatory bowel disease in 15 minutes. So obviously it's a huge task as we've all had to um, sort of walk you through. But I think important to understand where we are in the field right now. And as you noted, there's so much of an explosion of therapy, particularly for ulcerative colitis, and now uh, Crohn's is following closely behind. What I thought I would do is sort of help share with you where our mindset is when we are thinking about therapy and think about what the future uh, lies ahead. Here are my disclosures. So why is it so important that we're even thinking about precision? What has, pre what has become a really big problem with us, for us? You know, we do have, obviously, an embarrassment of riches, particularly over uh, the last year and a half, but if we have a ton of toys in our toy chest but we don't know how to play with them, it really doesn't matter and we're just gonna be stuck. And really, the ability to tell you that the only studies that have really broken even a 50% remission rate is in pediatrics. Why is that? Because we don't wait 11 years before starting an advanced therapy, which is the average disease duration for clinical trials. So by the time an individual actually enters a trial, particularly Crohn's, where it's a transmural fibrostenosing disease, how do we expect our remission rates to get to get better. So I think we have a lot of room for improvement, and there's a lot that goes into this sort of net remission rate calculation, but it's more to say that is it precision, or is it just that we have to start advanced therapies earlier? I'm going to vote for the second, actually, because I think there's going to be some emerging evidence at DDW that a biomarker that's to predict who's going to progress Get, guess what ruined that trial was that everyone started an advanced therapy within two to four weeks after diagnosis. And that was more important than a biomarker predicting which drug is going to work. So I think it's, and avoiding corticosteroids, which is our other mission and passion when we talk about IBD. So I think we've got a lot of room for improvement, but I think a lot of it has to do with timing. So I'm going to walk you through what are some of the things that may also help us achieve this sort of improvement in patients' inductions into remission, but most important, durable maintenance. So we know that the 
today concept is. We've got a lot of things in our, in our uh, toy chest, as noted, and we sort of just think about, is there a stepwise approach? Is it because I may have a sample available, so I'm gonna use that? Is access a problem? Was I denied for every other time that I've tried to prescribe this drug? Let me go with the one that I know I can get. You know, there's a lot. That's not highly scientific, and we're also treating all IBD patients as if they have the exact same biology. So that is where we really need to start thinking about grouping individuals maybe into different omics, different classification, and targeting our therapies to these. So now I'm gonna walk you through sort of the concepts of personalization and precision, and just high level, because each talk, each section is a talk on its own. So I'm just gonna give you conclusions around where we are at predicting who is at most risk of needing an advanced therapy. I would venture to tell you, based on the table here, is that when you look at Crohn's disease, who we say would have a mild prognosis, it's almost, there's only one factor that would tell you this patient does not need advanced therapy, which by definition means that in Crohn's disease, where five ASAs do not work and are not approved, yet remain the most commonly prescribed, first-line therapy for Crohn's disease is, is a disease that needs an advanced therapy from day one. Choosing which one, that's another question, but if you use them early, at least in transmural disease like Crohn's. With UC, we have a little bit more wiggle room because we do have isolated proctitis, we do have mild to moderate left-sided colitis, and it's a mucosal disease for all intensive purposes. Are, however, with the introduction of ultrasound, we're actually seeing that UC is a transmural process. Uh, however, the main target of our anti-inflammatory is through the mucosal anti-inflammatory uh, cascade. However, there have been markers that have been proposed to be predicting of who's going to progress. NOD2, a gene that was discovered in 2001, the first Crohn's gene, was thought to be maybe in adults to be predictive of an individual who may develop stricturing small bowel disease, interesting. Also, people have looked at polygenic risk scores, which means not just taking one gene, but taking the entire genome-wide association study candidate genes. So these are genes that predispose you to IBD. It's, it's not shocking to say that those genes don't necessarily mean anything except you're going to get IBD. And what we've tried to find is, do they predict treatment? Do they predict prognosis? There really hasn't been anything that has proven to be, to be so. And then the one markers that have been proven to be predictive of prognosis are those called serologic immune markers. Those are the infamous ASCA, PIANCA, et cetera, the antimicrobial antigen antibodies have actually been pro proven to be the only thing right now that predicts more aggressive Crohn's disease, and also to let you know that in every um, study cohort we have that are what we're following people at high risk and looking at whether we can predict who's actually going to get IBD, there's four main what we call preclinical cohorts out there, and every single one of them, the number one predictor of who's going to get IBD is serologies and they elevate as you get closer to diagnosis. So there's something meaningful about these serologies in terms of predicting certain elements. What about the right therapy? There has been multiple attempts to look at tissue at the time of a clinical trial, suggesting when someone is a non-responder, can we compare what the tissue gene expression looks like in those who responded versus those who don't? Without knowing what their tissue looked like on day one, sort of complicated because that doesn't sh tell you anything about predicting who will respond. You're just looking cross-sectionally at the time of endoscopy, you did or did not respond to, in this example, the group from Oxford used the biopsies from all of Janssen's UC studies, galimumab in particular, and looked at whether or not they can look in the tissue, and it found that oncostatin M, or oncostatin M receptor, was a gene expressed over and over in people who didn't respond to anti-TNF. Now, there is a company that actually has an oncostatin M target um, early, early days. They're looking at this as a target for treatment. One thing that I really want to say is that although I sort of said genes haven't really proven to be helpful to predict, but what they have been helpful is us understanding why IL-23, such as ustekinumab or zinkizumab, doesn't work for rheumatoid arthritis. They work for psoriatic arthritis, psoriasis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. That's because IL-23 receptor gene is not a gene variant that causes susceptibility to RA. 
So the first link where we started to see that genetically there may be a tie-in to the biology of these diseases, and I'll end with sort of that concept. So I thought this was really cool, because this is the first time we sort of thought, oh, maybe this does make sense why some of our drugs do and don't work in different immune conditions, and start to follow the biology a little bit more in treatment choice. The company that had taken on this concept of a companion diagnostic or therodiagnostic was previously Prometheus Bioscience, which has now been acquired by Merck. And this was Steph Targan and Dermot McGovern, um, who start, founded the company. And Steph's whole vision for the last, uh, goodness, 30 plus years has really been that there must be a genetic predisposition to people responding to certain therapies. That's the the hypnosis I grew up on. And so the idea that maybe there was a panel of genes, and this was a mucosal buccal swab actually, where they ran a whole genetic algorithm from 200,000 different omic data points from thousands of patients at Cedars that uh, Prometheus Bioscience exclusively licensed that entire data set. And they ran some algorithms and said, hey, if you are positive for this gene for TL1A, which is tumor necrosis factor li um, ligand 1A, um, and this uh, is a target for four different companies right now. So everyone is now chasing this as the next target of IBD. We're done with TNFs. We've got plenty of IL-23s. Now the biologic of, of interest is TL1A. And what, unfortunately, despite Steph being evangelical around this topic, they actually showed that this drug worked even in people who were CDX negative. So they sort of ditched the concept that this drug class only works for those who are positive for this gene and said it probably works for all comers in UC. We're waiting for the Crohn's data that may be a better signal in Crohn's disease, so we'll wait to see, and that's in hand, Merck's hands right now to try and bring this uh, asset to market. So when I talk about biology and I talk about that IL-23 sort of gene concept, let's extrapolate that now to what was recently published in 2021 by an amazing group of immunologists, scientists in our field who said, you know what, you're thinking about all of these immune diseases wrong. You need to start grouping them into either organ hubs that share a common biology, skin, gut, eyes, joints, and think of them as biologic or cytokine hubs. These are what in this hub of, and I use IL-23 as probably the most impressive hub because we follow the lead now of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis because lo and behold, IL-23 is the main cytokine for CD, UC, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis. So it's not shocking that rizinkizumab, for example, which was approved in 2019 for psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, was a revolutionary addition to our treatment paradigm for Crohn's disease. The first drug ever in a clinical trial to show endoscopic response 12 weeks after starting the therapy in a disease group that have had disease for at least 11 years. Pretty impressive when you think about the bar that the FDA has now set for Crohn's therapies to come to market. In 1998, when infliximab came to market, it was brought to market based on, do you feel better in the last seven days? That was it, a Crohn's disease activity index score of 70 points. Then we moved to remission, you have to feel really good, and now the bar has been completely reset for Crohn's disease therapies to come to market. You have to show that you've dosed the drug to have endoscopic response and now we have a trial called the sequence trial, where it was head-to-head -head of ustekinumab versus rizinkizumab. Their primary outcome was endoremission. So we continue to raise the bar to hopefully meet what we believe is the true target of treating IBD. Finally, the regulatory agencies have caught up with what we're telling people they need to achieve as the target for patients for success. So can we predict these responses to tumor necrosis factor? maybe, and say, hey, maybe we can look at response our patients have to these drugs we currently have and say, gosh, is there a biologic marker that helps me say, you get TNF, you get IL-23. Why do I say that? Because we see these paradoxical psoriasiform-like reactions to tumor necrosis factor. They look just like psoriasis on biopsies with a little bit of eczema. And when you actually treat these patients, take them off the TNF and put them on 23s, the majority of them completely resolve their skin. 
because we did some skin taping and we looked at the gene expression in these skins and, and the skin and said, it looks just like psoriasis. So the question is, could the skin, if we did some skin taping before we even start a drug to tell us that biologically the gut and the skin are in keeping with what a psoriasis or a psoriaform dermatitis patient would look like and avert even using TNF. Imagine using the possibility to predict that your gut biology will respond differently to different classes based on using the skin. Why is the skin important? Because the drugs that work in the skin work in the gut. So the concept of trying to be more organ specific and cytokine specific. So Dave sort of set me up for success on the magic of induction and the right dose. So you know we've looked at the right dose of, of different therapies over time and particularly infliximab, it has the most emphasis on drug monitoring because it's the one that has the most anti-drug antibodies, the pharmacokinetics are really individualized and we've shown that different drug levels correlate with different levels of remission. And that's why the target continues to move. We also show that when you actually study and increase your drug levels early in induction, and if someone said you have one magic time that you can check a drug level with infliximab to set the entire journey of your patient on infliximab, it would be what Dave showed you, which would be at the third infusion, if the pre-dose drug level is less than 17, your patient will never make it to week eight without antibodies. So what you can do is magically change the trajectory of this patient by just bringing them in early, increasing their dose, and getting them back on track. And we actually show that we essentially eliminate the risk of anti-drug antibodies, even in the 50% of all your patients who walk in your clinic on Monday are going to have a gene that predisposes them to anti-infliximab drug antibodies. And what we showed is that if you dose it correctly up front, doesn't matter if you're gene positive or gene negative. You just have to give them enough drug. So the number one driver of drug antibodies in our patients with infliximab in particularly is not enough drug. So the true top down is give them a lot up front and then de-escalate once the patient's inflammation and they've achieved endoscopic remission. The other thing is there's other studies that have shown that different levels early, so this study actually looked at that if you got a drug level of 23 at the second one, and this one showed 10 um, at the week six, but there's been lots of studies that have showed that you need something higher at week six, that you are able to get better endoscopic outcomes at induction. The last point is the right target, and this is for you, so you can start bringing this target to your clinic. This is all about transmural healing. So we stopped at endoscopic remission or healing as being the target we feel is the penultimate. We're still not changing surgical rates dramatically. We've lowered it significantly with endo remission, but in Crohn's disease, not as much as you see. Why? We're missing the target. The target for Crohn's is transmural healing. How could you actually expect a drug that only you're going, looking at the inner mucosal lining to change the natural history of the disease in a cross, in a transmural disease? And what this recent study showed you is that if you looked at hospitalizations and surgery, here you've got clinical, you've got bio, biochemical, meaning CRP and Calpro. Here you have endoscopic, definitely lowered the risk of surgery and hospitalizations. But look at what having a transmural healing did to rates of surgery in Crohn's disease patients. It essentially annihilated the risk of surgery by going after the right target. And how do you assess that? You can assess it by MRE, but uh, intestinal ultrasound is sort of taking over in terms of point of care, looking at the small and large bowel and making decisions in clinic as to what you next move. And now there's papers saying, this is the level you may want to achieve to get transmural healing. So the next big, treat to trough or treat to target is all going to be matching the exposure to the transmural healing using intestinal ultrasound in the clinic. So also showing that with infliximab, they did similarly, they looked at transmural outcome and looked at what level. Don't worry about the, the level specifically. It's more just the concepts that the target we have been searching for for Crohn's disease may actually be here. We just didn't know how to look for it. And we didn't think we can get it. 
So as we think about the biology, I just wanted to leave you with this concept that we have overlapping comorbidities, and Gary noted around skin and joints and possible therapeutic targets, but this is a good slide to just remind you about all these comorbid biologies that are actually happening in our patients. And we have drugs that work for more than one condition, and some of our patients have both. And so dual advanced therapy is probably going to be the answer in these very refractory patients because how are we thinking that one biology, one target is going to solve everybody's Crohn's or UC? And that is where we fell short, is we expected one target, one biology in a disease that has 300 plus genes, Lord knows how many environmental triggers and biology and pathways to save the day. So there are some emerging data on dual advanced therapy. There was a meta-analysis that was published here, and we're actually presenting at um, AIBD, the largest cohort of dual advanced therapy. These are the combinations we have used, and there, Dave has recently published on using Yupa uh, uh, desidinib early with um, usikinumab, um, and using that as a way to try and go after dual biologic processes. So, Sorry I went a little bit over, but this topic is so critical to really understanding where we're going in IBD, and we're not stable. We're innovating, and we're really looking for ways to change the lives of our patients. So we need to go beyond just how many stools are you having today, Marla, to actually predicting and asking them the right question, are you living your best life every day? Am I solving the problem of you having control of your disease? We need to match our therapies to prognosis. We need to think about sequencing because the order of things matters, especially if you are genetically susceptible to different reactions to TNFs. The need for speed has emerged and the jacks have sort of crushed everything. And now we have an expectation that you wake up the next day and you're fabulous. So we have a different bar that we now have to reach. Um, always thinking about pregnancy, and I know we're gonna have a case on pregnancy in a minute, so we can talk about the nuances of these all these incredible therapies we have. What matters to patients most is where we need to think through, and we need to stop thinking empirically and take some of this information and start creating the masterpiece that each of our IBD patients are. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marla. I think we have a case discussion. We're going to cut into the break a little bit, unfortunately, but uh, we'll try to be as quick as possible with the case presentations. But this is the most exciting part. We want to see what, what happens in the clinic. So we have a few presentations. So I met my colleague, uh, my partner, Dr. Agarwal, present the first case. Um, so, Charlie. Thank you all for letting me speak, and I'd like to thank our distinguished faculty for coming and joining us today. So we'll start with my first case. Um, so we have a 28-year-old female. She has a reported history of ulcerative colitis, and she's currently 16 weeks pregnant, and she presented to clinic for evaluation of diarrhea and rectal bleeding. She was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis at the age of 16 by a pediatric gastroenterologist who has since retired, so we don't have any records, but this is what she recalls in clinic. She doesn't know the extent of her ulcerative colitis, but she does recall being treated for steroids for three months. She was given omeprazole at some point, and she was given some sort of enema, but doesn't recall the name. She denies any extraintestinal manifestations. Um, she has no other medical problems, and she's never undergone any surgery. She's not on any medications. She specifically denies taking any NSAIDs. And her symptoms right now are six to seven bowel movements with blood, including nocturnal bowel movements. And she complains of difficulty gaining weight, and this is a concern of her OB. On exam, her vital signs are stable, and physical exam is largely unremarkable. So this is the first stopping point. So we have a pregnant patient who has a possible history of ulcerative colitis, and she presents to clinic with diarrhea and rectal bleeding. So Dr. Lichtenstein, what would, you, what would be your approach in sort of managing this patient at this point in terms of labs and stool studies? So I think this is a classic case we see a lot of, someone with known ulcerative colitis. The question is, does she have ulcerative colitis that's causing her symptoms? And the old saying is, round up the usual suspects. So stool for enteric pathogens, C. diff, oven parasite, calprotectin, <clears throat> CRP, CBC, CMP, sed rate we get, 
as a routine and see, do we have any things that come about? Is this E. coli? Is this salmonella? Is this something else that can simulate active IBD? If the patient's sick enough, we might admit her for the hospital for monitoring as well, uh, because she is 16 weeks pregnant, and that's a common time where pregnancy might be lost, as well get our obstetrics colleagues involved uh, at this point as well. But I think this is something that's rather routine. Treatment wouldn't be done initially. We can get results back typically within a day. So within one day, we can get back. If we need to, we put her in our overnight observation and observe. But I think this is it's concerning for the patient and for the caregivers because the one thing you want to do is preserve the baby. Um, Could so I clarify a couple points? Yes, of course. Um, the first one is, so this is a, a person who had pediatric onset IBD by history and was on no therapy when she conceived? No therapy right now when she... And is she, did she quit smoking when she got pregnant? She, she was never a smoker. Okay. I just wanted to clarify those points. Um, I'm going to reserve comment for Dr. Dubinsky, who runs a pregnancy and preconception counseling clinic, and let her tell us what she would do here. Marla? Sure. Um, and you said it was pen, ulcerative colitis, or left-sided? So right now we don't know, and we don't have any history because her... And you have no yes, history notes or anything? No, okay. so we are looking towards needing endoscopy at some point. Okay. So just as a reminder that at 16 weeks, the good news is organogenesis is done. So any therapy you do choose, um, whether it crosses the placenta or not, is on the table, you know, in terms of your approach. If you presented at seven weeks, it would be a little bit... And with fulminant refractory colitis, that's a whole other discussion because of the organogenesis. So she's past that, and the number one goal for you is symptom contr um, inflammatory control. There's nothing else through the lens through which you need to look at. We've also shown that pregnant women with flares actually have a worse prognosis than non-pregnant women with flares. So this is somebody, as Gary noted, you know, making sure the OBs, and let's just assume for the sake of the discussion, baby's growing and, and all is okay there. Um, and you're going to um, go with, obviously, rectal control once you've ru ruled out inflammation. You should start with, especially, I don't know if she's having urgency, but you can imagine she's having urgency, blood, et cetera. Regardless of the cause, there's low-hanging low fruit. Try and get some rectal control over her symptoms. Um, but then, you know, to be honest, we use probably the most go-to therapy in this case. If you're, now we use ultrasound, so I would have an answer for you in that clinic. So Ude, that's another potential beautiful role, is in our pregnancy clinic where you're not invasively scoping. There are some people who would do a flex sig in this scenario. I'm not recommending it because we have ultrasound, but if you really need it or you believe she didn't have a previous diagnosis, but really you're gonna give her infliximab is going to be your approach. You may want to bring her in to get her started. As Gary noted, this is not someone you want on the outside. The risk of, of miscarriage here is very high based on her activity. So some may give her IV steroids in the hospital. Again, it's not ideal, but it would be a short course to just get her under control. Um, those are the things that I would, I would say we do in this particular population. Yeah. One, one other thing to mention, remember you can do a non-gadolinium MRI if you're concerned about things. If you feel that there's mm -hmm. some other complication, if the exam suggests a megacolon, you don't need to do an x-ray. And that'll give you a lot of information. It'll tell you the extent of colitis to a reasonable approach. Yes, yeah, so as Gary said, you can do an oral contrast cross-sectional imaging, um, not IV contrast. That's what his, he was trying to make clear, which is correct. So this patient had, uh, never had a uh, flex sig? So I was going to ask you, Dr. Shen, actually, what would be your approach towards doing a flex sig in a uh, pregnant patient? I would do the, uh, use a tiny scope and uh, no air insufflation, unplug it. You go there to the rectum, five centimeters, take a few pieces of the biopsies, posterior war, not the anterior war posterior war. And then if you have the chronicity of the histology, you have diagnosis, minimum, no air insufflation, just minimum. Pregnancy also risk. increases the risk for CMV, although rare, it, independent of being on immunotherapy. So you would want to know about that as well. I, you said her vitals were okay, but I didn't see labs yet, right? 
Uh, so I'm just going to the next slide and I'll present. So on Ooh. testing, her hemoglobin is nine, platelets are 400, her albumin is two, her CRP is 60, and in our institution, a normal is less than eight. Stool infectious studies are negative. Calprotectin comes back at 1100. Of course, it comes back after we do the unsedated flex sig. And um, we actually went till the descending colon, and she. this is a representative picture showing severe Mayo 3 colitis. Path comes back with chronic active colitis, and again, negative for CMV. And we started her on steroids, and this is sort of where I was debating whether to admit her, but given how severe her colitis looks, she does get admitted. Can I just comment on the labs as a teaching point? So just as a reminder, in pregnancy, this outside of the CRP, the labs you're going to see is a hemoglobin between eight and nine, that's normal, an iron of 14, a sed rate of 78, and an albumin of 2.2. Those are normal pregnancy labs. And that's where people get caught off. Not, CRP is an exception here, because CRP, you would not see that in pregnancy. But Calpro and CRP will help you differentiate sometimes pregnancy labs. We, everyone gets freaked out. I get calls like, oh my god, my patient is fine, but their labs are so abnormal. So just a reminder that pregnancy physiology labs will look very similar to a flare in most patients. One, one thing I'll also mention is stool infection studies negative it's important to specify that it should be an enteric pathogen panel because you'll miss many infectious complications coming about in addition to C. diff and, if appropriate, ONP because we see numerous E. coli scenarios, um, things of the nature that you wouldn't otherwise pick up. The rule is if you're looking for something such as E. coli, a culture may pick up perhaps 30% where the enteric pathogen panel is virtually identical to us saying it is or it isn't present. I would just um, add, if she was iron deficient and had an albumin that was quite that low, I would still worry that she might be quite ill and that this had been going on prior to conception mm -hmm. even, uh, which would suggest that her disease was active, um, clearly not severe in order to get pregnant, but that that also portended her getting worse during the pregnancy state. And take Dave's thought process further also is that these labs, if due to her disease, um, would be a poor prognostic indicator of TNF response just because she's having such severe sort of TNF losing enteropathy potential because TNF follows the albumin if it is due to her colitis and not due to her pregnancy, yeah. Um, so we sort of covered, you know, this was my next stopping point. She has severe Mayo 3 colitis, um, in, at least until the descending colon, possibly extending further, but we didn't go any further than that. And um, Dr. Dubinsky, you sort of mentioned that y your initial choice may be to start infliximab and ASAP. So what dose of infliximab would you start? And then, more importantly, how would you do therapeutic drug monitoring in a pregnant patient? Yeah, so actually the... It's funny, there's not a lot of difference on your approach to acute severe you see in pregnancy versus not. It's just you feel even more uh, of an urgency to get yourself together and get the dose right. So just like we would approach, let's say her labs were like that in a non-pregnant woman, it would be 10 milligram per kilogram up front. Because again, what I, sh is that go high, you never lose with high, you always lose with low. So if you go with your win situation, you're always gonna do better if you go with 10 per kilo. And for her, I would get a drug level the same, before the third infusion, optimize her entirely. The same concept, obviously, not using a concomitant immunomodulator would be the only sort of, I would tell you, you're not gonna start in pregnancy, you don't start an immunomodulator. You don't start metho, you don't start thiopurines, it's useless in a pregnant woman for sh a, a woman this far along as well. So that's my take on it, yeah. It's also important to recognize there's no drug-related adverse events relating to too high a drug level. Years ago we thought, oh, the psoriasis may be, but the reality is that's been born not to be true. So you can always overdose, the only thing is cost. So it's important to treat high and appropriately. I'm not here to sell everybody on cyclosporin, but I will say that it can be used in pregnancy, and we certainly have done so. 
I will also say that this woman has number of prognostic markers to say that she's heading towards surgery, and surgery during yep. severe colitis in pregnancy is usually safest during the second trimester. Um, I'll also say that this woman has one additional factor that predicts she's not going to respond to the infliximab, and that's that she's being presented at a conference right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm concerned about the low albumin. The albumin of two in a pregnant patient with active colitis is always concerning. I think uh, having a surgeon on board is always important. And she and had it continuous up to the f up to the descending, right? So she probably, with those labs, she probably had beyond left sided. We just don't know it. So ju the... just for the sake of time, I actually um, cut short the case a little bit. So we, she did get start on 10 milligrams, and um, her symptoms did resolve, Dr. Rubin, um, just for the sake of time. And we did get a week six infliximab level on her um, prior to her third infusion, and her level was 27, Surprising. no That's antibodies. Um, and she does end up Good delivering news. a healthy baby boy. So. Just a quick question. Now she presents to clinic, and she's de 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 delivered a healthy baby boy, and she has questions about vaccinations and whether she can breastfeed on infliximab. If anyone on the panel would like to answer that. Me? Yeah, uh, Looking at the one woman on the table. I'd say that um, they're like, what would you do? Um, yeah, just as a reminder that um, you can absolutely breastfeed with a on our biologics. It's the small molecules that we're recommending against, you know, like the JAKs or the S1Ps that we now have. So breastfeeding, you would encourage them to, if they so desire, to, to be able to do that. And just as a reminder, just like our patients, we advise that they don't receive live vaccines while they're on their therapies, right, on the biologics or the small molecules. So just like just like we do with our patients, we let them know that their baby, at least until five months, it's sort of lower too, but if you want to be strict, six months before they would receive a live vaccine. The good news is the only live vaccine that is administered before six months is the rotavirus vaccine. Um, I give them a letter to give to daycare and to their pediatrician and call it a day. Um, if they've had another child in the house, the herd immunity will be successful at that point if the other baby had the rotavirus vaccine or had rota. So again, there are some pediatricians who will ask me for some bizarre reason whether at six months they can give part of the course of rota. I'm like, if that's what the AAP says, you do you, but for us, it's not, you know, it's no longer in our court to decide what happens. And therefore, that's the only vaccine that would be left out of the conversation. RSV is very fascinating. That's the more recent discussion because the RSV vaccine is recommended for uh, women between week 32 and 36 of pregnancy, right? Um, to give them the vaccine so the baby may have immunity. Now, we don't know the immunity of a baby born to a mom on infliximab in response to the RSV vaccine. So the question would be whether the baby can get the immune glob, the passive vaccination, and the answer is yes. So that the babies are born in a high RSV season, which is all of my moms right now, are getting it in their 30, in that week of pregnancy, but also the babies are getting the um, passive vaccination if they're born in RSV season. So that's a new level for us to have to advise on. One other thing to say that the mom needs other vaccines. Pneumococcal pneumonia, the Prevnar 20 is what we typically would give at this point in time. Uh, if she's had chicken pox and hadn't had the varicella vaccine, then a Shingrix vaccine should be initiated. It's currently FDA approved, age 18 and older. Uh, and we've been very successful in virtually all patients getting insurance coverage for that. Um, in addition, make sure Hep B is there. Given you've given this, you want to check the Hep B serology, make sure it's not Hep B surface antigen positive. That would be a problem. Then you'd need to use Intecvir or some other agent directly. Um, and the usual vaccines we need to contemplate. The RSV data has recently been presented. The group at Mayo presented some interesting data, Frank Ferre, uh, at the ACG meetings, that there is a higher rate in IBD patients. So immune-suppressed IBD patients, the guidelines are currently updated. We're updating for the health maintenance for IBD. Uh, and we're going to include in that the RSV vaccine directly, because it's something that's appropriate in those who are immune compromised. So if you're in the audience saying, I I don't want to remember all these things. Um, there is an updated checklist for vaccinations and pre 
therapy, testing, and monitoring, you can go to cornerstoneshealth.org. It's free and it's in multiple languages. Marla and I just updated it, cornerstoneshealth.org. And the checklist is, includes RSV, it includes our newer therapies that have FDA approval and all the things you might want to have for your team. I actually give it to my patients now, which makes it easy for them to know if they're up to date and sometimes patient-driven care in that regard helps. Awesome. Right, thank you. Want to sit here? So I think I don't know much time for presentation of entire cases, but I'll try to be uh, quick and wrap up uh, the presentation. So this is a case of a 40-year-old male with a long-term history of Crohn's um, who presented with diarrhea and abdominal pain. Um, obviously has significant symptoms. I diagnosed 20 years ago, has tried the usual therapies, ASA therapies, infliximab, adalimumab, or the anti-TNFs. He actually had a history of a descending colon stricture as well, secondary to Crohn's and prevent a resection and a colostomy in 2006. And subsequently was tried on Vido and Istokinemab as well, and it was referred to me after that, after he failed multiple therapies. So this was in August of last year when he saw him. Uh, obviously, on exam is pretty unremarkable, um, except that his uh, labs are significantly abnormal for uh, iron deficiency anemia, low albumin, high CRP, and high FCP. And infectious workup was negative, including a of PCR. So this is the initial colonoscopy from last year. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is the IC valve area, the wide open um, valve where the TI looks normal. And we come back uh, and there's, uh, if you see his colon, it's pretty inflamed. As you see, moderate to severe Crohn's disease. Um, and he's got uh, pancolitis and um, you see all the deep ulcers uh, as you go along. The entire colon was inflamed. And you could see as evidence of previous surgery in this descending colon as we go uh, further uh, down along the way. See a polyp from inflammation lesion. All of his biopsies were negative in the past. You went pretty fast today. your day. So what was the surgery in the descending colon? He had a descending colon stricture from his Crohn's and he had a resection of that stricture. And um, he had a colostomy temporarily for some time and then it was reversed after six months. And he's had infliximab, adalimumab, mesalamine. Sertilizumab. Uh, he also tried vidalizumab and istikinumab. <laughs> Everything before he came here. And was he a PK failure to TNF or a mechanism? Secondary, failure? secondary loss of response. So he tried infliximab first. He responded initially. This was evidence of surgery you see there in the descending colon. Yeah. But the resection was done. But um, he tried anti TNFs before. He responded initially to infliximab, and then subsequently failed. But subsequent anti TNFs he didn't really respond to adalimumab and sertilizumab at all. He was actually on combination therapy with sertilizumab to avoid anti reactions. But all that care was in Ohio when he where he moved from. Uh, he, he moved to the Space Coast in Melbourne. It's like a couple hours away for exactly working in a space research company. Um, so that's where we are at this point. So, so this is the discussion. You all probably have a QR code here uh, to, uh, for the audience participation. So based on this, um, what are the options? Um, obviously, it's Crohn's to the colon. So you think about a colorectal surgery for consideration of total proctocolectomy and an endileostomy or intentional J-poach for Crohn's is a possibility. Obviously, you can consider switching to Rizinkizumab, which is IL-23, or you can consider recommend a clinical trial as a possibility because it's failed multiple therapies. You want to add immunomodulator on top of istikinumab on failures, or you can try to switch to UPA. At that time, in August of last year, it was off-label for Crohn's, but you can switch to about that at that point. But these are the five options. Um, the audience wants OAT, and then we can get the participation of... Well, uh, just to make sure the audience knows, UPA is now on label for yes. moderate to severe Crohn's or UC after exposure to anti-TNF, so that would be one of the options. So yeah. maybe five should be switched to UPA. Yeah. Yeah. When, the slot, when he had the case, it was an off-label. It was August of last year, so I'm presenting the situation right. at that point. At that time, it was off-label for Crohn's, but now it's approved for Crohn's as well. So, I mean, there are lots of options. I think uh, people are thinking about all the different options. So, 
I'd like to start with uh, maybe Marla, starting from that side and going this way. Sure, yeah, I was going straight to number five, and it could be that depending on that response, I, I go to this combo story that may have to evolve. Not that he responded to Ustek. So that is another challenge that someone can make and say, does someone who fails Ustek, do they merit too? Yeah. So just as a reminder that in the uh, Fortify, Advanced Motivate Fortify, which is the phase three Rizinkizumab Crohn's trial, they did allow 18% of the uh, population could have been exposed, deemed probably failure to ustekinumab. And in that population, although the, a small subset of the patients, it appears that they did similarly to those who were in the bio-naive population, sorry, bio-exposed population, meaning they didn't do worse than those that were exposed to prior biologics. So there was a hint um, that that would be the case. So that's in the sequencing of Ustek with Riza. There is obviously the sequence data, which was a head-to-head Ustek, which is a different question than what you're asking here. So I don't want people to confuse sequence yeah. from what we know. So I just wanted to highlight. Well, so it would be five for me. Yeah. I mean, I agree with Marla, um, as I often do. I will just point out to the audience, this patient has an albumin of 2.8. So I th if you look at the phase three trials for RISA in Crohn's, um, the median albumin was not this low, and therefore I would predict or, or at least suggest to you that you're better off with a small molecule when somebody has a protein losing colopathy or whatever else is going on that contributed to that presentation. And I would absolutely choose five in my practice. I will add that um, RISA can be used after ustekinumab to Marla's point, and we've had some good fortune uh, seeing that, and I do think it does have a role. But in this patient, I would go to five as well. And I, I concur with that, but some of the caveats, when you look back at what you presented, it was adalimumab every two weeks, and there was no TDM done per se, so these are things you may have options still going back, but I think your best bang for your buck is going to be UPA at this point in time. The albumin is the key, as David pointed out. Any small molecule albumin is not something that one has to worry about, so TOFA and UPA these are things that you can do best with that. Whereas, if you look at the biologics, infliximab is the most dependent on albumin of all the agents we have. With a little caveat, though, that the albumin for small molecule, what is being said, has, is thought to be related to the pharmacokinetic and clearance. But albumin being that low is a marker of bad disease. So right. your drug automatically is going to be set up a little bit less robust. You know, yeah. you're already starting at a lower, Absolutely more sicker. Right. So just to keep that in mind, that albumin serves as two roles in this particular yeah. situation. So just to, to systematize this, I, it's upadacidin of 45 milligrams once a day is the induction dosing in Crohn's. It's for 12 weeks. Um, I would... Uh, plan for vaccination against Zoster with the recombinant vaccine uh, that Gary mentioned, Shingrix. Uh, it can be done after you start therapy. And I would repeat a CalPro. It's nice that you had a baseline of 2,000. I would repeat the CalPro usually in my practice at four to six weeks just to make sure we're going. But most patients by the end of the second week, maybe sooner, within days, may tell you they're feeling better. So this is another plug for ultrasound, that when you look at and do IUS in the clinic, um, post like at eight weeks. Um, if it doesn't change below a certain percentage, you could pretty well predict that you need to do something different. Yes. So you don't need to wait anymore for a treat to target Well, scope. right. At, at ACG, we presented, and Marla was part of that session. Um, ultrasound led to change in treatment earlier and remission rates sooner in our patients. And specifically, it was the cohort we had used at our center with UPA, but at DDW, we hope to present it with other therapies showing the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So this patient, unfortunately, UPA could not be approved by insurance initially no. <laughs> after all that because it's off-label at that point for Crohn's. Uh, so he's actually on start on Rizincuzumab, but it's approved for Crohn's at that point. He improved by 50% dramatically within the first 8 to 12 weeks on treatment. But he had some symptoms. He was, blood and this thing, he was actually requiring some low-dose prednisone to manage his symptoms at that point. Um, so instead of time, we'll just go ahead. So actually, we got samples of TOFA, so we started TOFA in, in combination. Even this was actually not, even then, at this point, OPA was not approved for Crohn's, which was actually December, uh, November, December or so of last year. 
So symptoms continued to improve after starting TOFA 22, and his biomarkers and FCB became normal. And if you look at his scope uh, in February of this year, I think April of this year, after this uh, combination, this is his colon looks completely normal. So just to level normal. set for the audience, tofacitinib is the other JAK inhibitor. Yeah. It is approved for moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. There were two phase two trials of TOFA in Crohn's that were both negative. Mm -hmm. But there is a multicenter uh, retrospective case series looking at TOFA in Crohn's, and it did work in some Crohn's patients with Crohn's colitis, real world, open label, blah, blah. So I, when I saw your colonoscopy at first, even though it looked a little patchy, I was still thinking this looked more like a ulcerative colitis, colitis. phenotype, even with that history. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I think and that this is a nice outcome. But in this, now in 2023, 2024, we would go with the labeled drug. Yeah, I, think, I think, Dave, what you're also getting at is that the, from a precision perspective and a phenotype, it could be large bowel versus small, small bowel, bowel when you talk difference. about focus. So what Dave was saying, and I agree, that when you have like a UC-looking Crohn's, it would make sense that a jack would predominantly work in the colonic. And I'd even venture to tell you that in the UPA trial, when they looked at small bowel response versus large bowel, those that had large bowel involvement did do better than isolated small bowel involvement with even UPA. So just understand the concepts here around maybe targeting the biology. biology. It gets back to, yeah. <laughs> yay, it gets back to the biology and understanding that individual's biologic responsiveness. Okay. Yeah. One other thing, if you look back at the TOFA trials initially, they did not mandate colonoscopy Correct. as inclusion criteria. So the flaw of the study was it was a decision by the company to save finances. And for this Crohn's. is something for yeah. Crohn's. And, and that's part of the difficulty. So one says this is not gonna be something that necessarily holds. And because a trial doesn't show benefit doesn't mean a patient won't show benefit. There may be different characteristics that are not well assessed because a trial is aggregate numbers an inclusion criterion. When you don't have a colonoscopy initially at the outset, you don't know if there's active disease. So the FDA has required colonoscopy at the outset of all trials in Crohn's to ensure that what you're dealing with is not IBS symptoms or non-inflammatory symptoms, but findings of mucosal involvement. So it's key. I think it also comes down to dose. Um, that 22 milligrams is different than 45 milligrams yes. because right. when you look at the 30 milligram in UC, you know, Peter Higgins for the, for the cohort right. of in-hospital acute severe UC, he did publish, you know, under an IND about 30 milligrams and it worked better than 20 and better than 10 for TOFA. So I think we also have to understand that there's selectivity possible enhancements by selectively only targeting JAK1, which is what upadacitinib is, versus 1,3, and a broader approach may not be as selective for Crohn's. So there's a lot, again, it gets down to the ustekinumab versus rizinkizumab story. Is there a biologic difference by being more selective? So I think TBD, all I'm happy about is that we have amazing therapy, so I don't actually care. But the ability to use them correctly, I think, is the key. Yeah. So in answer to the question you're putting up here, we yes. don't know the answer. Um, answer I would yeah. say that the jack did the heavy lifting and got him off steroids and healed the bowel, so I would leave that on. And the question of whether Riz is um, combining to it and doing something together is not clear to me. I, I suspect probably not, but you heard Marla say we just we've been using combo IL-23 with Jack, but it's usually been when in situations like this, but um, I think that if it was in my practice, if I could keep going with both drugs, I would, but otherwise I would lean into the Jack. Yeah. And I would yeah. probably switch to UPA because the insurance would give me a hard time when I tried to reauthorize the TOFA. But yes, again, it depends on risk factors because we do have to consider all of the comorbidities that may give rise to limiting yeah. use of Jack potentially. Yeah. But what I can tell you in those that we de-escalated who were on combo, most needed to be re-escalated to combo. Yeah. So once you go down this biologic dual pathway inhibition, removing the jack has been difficult. So I do wanna say what Dave was saying is you're gonna try as long as you can to stay on it. One thing okay. for sure I would not do with either TOFA or UPA is drop the dose to the lower dose in maintenance. I don't do that at all with either the jacks. I use 30 milligrams with UPA 
in maintenance, and I use 10 BID with TOFA or 22 once daily with TOFA in maintenance. Also, the role of TDM is not well established with RISA, mm -hmm. and it's not something that we should be doing routinely at all. Awesome. In the interest of time, I think combination therapy is going to be one of the futures, I think. We have an abstract DDW this year submitted um, on 25 patients with combination biologics and small molecules. So refractory patients, sometimes we achieve combination therapy to get them to remission and eventually switch them to monotherapy if possible down the line. But I think we'll talk about one more quick case maybe and then um, we'll wrap it up. Um, there's a 60-year-old female with past medical history of UC um, was referred because of multifocal, low-grade dispersion, high-grade dispersion, random biopsies in the ascending colon. Obviously, she's doing very well clinically. Um, in, in the past, she had failed response, uh, second dose of response to infliximab and vidalizumab, and a primary non-response to tofa and ustekinumab. Finally, achieved endoscopic remission on UPA, and currently on 30 milligrams of UPA and doing really well. And um, as I said, currently on UPA for ulcerative colitis, labs look good as far as um, uh, I think she's endoscopic and clinical remission. And this was um, the coronoscopy. We'll just quickly wrap it up. This is referred for dysplasia in the ascending colon. This is what it looks like. Obviously, she has Mayo zero, which looks good. But uh, if you carefully look at this, it is LCI imaging from Fuji, which is light control imaging. If you carefully look at it, there are two areas of redness uh, on the imaging. And if you carefully look at it, that looks like a dysplastic lesion there. One on that area, which you see in, up there. And as you come back here, you see one more very clearly here in this area. So, and the LCI is virtually, basically a virtual chrome endoscopy, uh, which is another way of detecting dysplasia. And this patient um, obviously underwent resection um, of that, and he went, came back, okay, uh, underwent EMR of both the lesions. In the interest of time, I'll just go to the next one. Uh, which one had high-grade dysplasia? Yeah, I'll, I'll come back. There's, uh, after this, I come back further down. And I see something else uh, popping up, which is unusual, some irregularity in the wall here on, on um, high definition white light. And then you see on LCI, you can see clearly the redness and abnormal uh, mucosa there. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the interest of time, we'll keep going here. Uh, so we resected this area here. Uh, It came back uh, okay. Uh, we were able to resect the area completely. Uh, the question of, we did some biopsies around the lesion. We ablated the area around it and did some biopsies to make sure there's no satisfactory dysplasia. The pathology of all these three lesions came back like this. Tubular adenoma with low-grade dysplasia. Tubular adenoma with low-grade dysplasia. The, the larger lesion we had removed came back as TVA with high-grade dysplasia. So biopsies around the lesion were negative. We ablated the lesion. Well, let me start by s saying that um, the term adenoma, it, is in the setting of colitis is something we don't often use yes, yeah. because of the fact that it may not have that same uh, progression and genetic markings of a sporadic or age-related um, polyp. So in, in our pathologies uh, reports, it'll probably say something like um, a polypoid lesion with low-grade dysplasia, dysplasia, or yeah. if it's tubular villus, they would call it high-grade most of the time. Yeah. And as much as you're an outstanding uh, endoscopist, the reality is this patient is telling you that their colon is starting to turn over, and this one multifocal worries me. So I do think this is likely somebody who would benefit from a colectomy. The question then becomes, is it a proctocolectomy, or because you've controlled the disease, is there any role for a subtotal colectomy with an ileosigmoid uh, anastomosis? And if the distal colon really looked good, that's one option to consider, but we usually reserve that for older patients who wouldn't tolerate a stoma. Um, I wouldn't necessarily try to preserve this entire colon. If Bo were here, he would disagree with me and describe yes, yeah. using an endoscope to perform colectomy. But I think that um, <laughs> it really is not indicated in a patient with multifocal disease and especially high-grade dysplasia. Dave, what, more, what is more. the data, sorry, um, educate me on those that do leave the rectum, what's the recurrence well, the people, in the rectum? The in people in whom uh, a rectal sparing surgery might be an option would be people who have rectal sparing, like the PSC phenotype of colitis, where there literally is histologic sparing of the rectum. The older patient who won't tolerate a stoma. The younger people, and this patient is how 68. old? 68. 68. So um, in younger people, and this probably doesn't classify as that, um, then 
uh, these are people who should have a proctocolectomy. In our follow-up data of people we did this in, we do have some who have uh, low-grade dysplasia develop. We haven't had anyone who had a cancer. We've had no one who needed another surgery, but our case series now is about 30 patients only. Okay. So I do think you have to be very careful here, and you definitely want to work with a colorectal surgeon who appreciates the risks and will work with you. I also much prefer hand-sewn anastomoses in these situations and getting rid of the rectal cuff. But these days, the colorectal surgeons, even those who are experienced, don't do that very often anymore. I'm going to differ some. I, I don't agree with the colectomy here whatsoever. I think these are a few adenomas. Whatsoever? Absolutely. Multifocal, low-grade, and high-grade dysplasia. <laughs> but they're, dis they're visible. These are not invisible lesions. They we would have been in any other time. In a 68-year-old woman, Dave, yeah. I, I absolutely would not send for a colectomy. I'd do close follow-up in three months, have them come if back. these were low-grade lesions, And I'd lesions, do dye spray maybe. chromoendoscopy to get better visualization, perhaps, as opposed to NBI or other things. These are patients we see all the time referred. And occasionally, again, it's shared decision-making with the patient that's critical, but the experience is that these patients typically do not progress. These are commonplace scenarios. I mean, I think Dave was part of the guidelines. Uh, the well, that guidelines. doesn't matter. Just, I think that yeah. the, I, I, I mean, it, my, the, the <laughs> consensus statement is just to people sitting around drinking right. coffee, uh, <laughs> myself included. And I don't disagree with Gary's watch and wait, or at least giving her one more exam, but I'm wondering what your, when your decision making would be. When you find a cancer, another high grade dysplastic lesion, or do you just keep going indefinitely? No, I think you evaluate then and you see, could this patient have a polyposis syndrome? Go back, take a family history. There are many, you know, does she have okay, a Okay, well, let's say she doesn't have that. Let's say this is a woman who's 68 who's had colitis for many years, now is under endoscopic um, control from the inflammation point of view, but has multifocal flat lesions that, yes, you can see some of them, Maybe there's others we didn't see, but let's say you saw all of them, but she has multiple lesions, including high-grade dysplasia. You don't think at least a consultation with a surgeon would be helpful? I didn't say don't consult the a patient. surgeon. I just said I don't think she needs a colectomy at this point based on the findings that we were presented. I think these are a few sporadic adenomas potentially, and whether or not this represents something, this is where I would biopsy the mucosa as well when you have a scenario as this and do chromoendoscopy to see. This patient may need a colectomy, but based on the data presented at this point, I wouldn't do that. Okay. So I think in the interest of time, this patient is referred to a surgeon for discussion as well. The patient elected to close surveillance at this point. Uh, it was done just three months ago. <coughs> so Not I'm going surprising. to probably um, bring her back in another three months and have a look again. Oh, so okay. I'll keep you posted hopefully for the next meeting if we need what happened, it's happened. But uh, at this point, she decided to hold off on surgery. What is this? On, on this contrast, is, this is another patient. This is her three months later. No. <laughs> <laughs> you were right. This is, this is another patient where I would like to get uh, Gary's opinion. This is a patient who had, a, again, referred for high-grade dysplasia on colonoscopy, random biopsies. But this isn't, obviously, it's not a random biopsy missed on this. But this, is a, <clears throat> this patient, would you think about surgery, Gary? I think when you get something like this and you can't adequately do surveillance and you have multiple polyps, that's an indication for a colectomy. Now, the question is, is it a total colectomy, a subtotal colectomy? Is this UC? Is this Crohn's? You know, these are the things you need to do to stage. Do an MR enterography to see. But this is something you can't do surveillance on adequately. Yeah. yeah. So this patient underwent total colectomy in JPO. Just a contrast scenario. I just want to present two uh, <coughs> scenarios where you should at least think about surveillance. And in a situation like this, you should think about surgery automatically. That's what it is. But yeah, in the interest of time, we'll wrap it up. Um, and thank you so much for all your time. No, we are half an hour beyond the schedule, but thanks, patient, for waiting for the entire afternoon. Sham, want to come? And thank you for all the faculty and enjoying discussion. You are enjoyable. Oh,